Hi, I'm Arifa Akbar. I'm going to read a few pages of my memoir, um, Consumed a Sister's Story. Three summers ago, my neighbour was told that her ovarian cancer had reached the terminal stage. Rosalind Hibbins emailed the occupants of the building about it matter-of-factly, as was her way, but when I went downstairs to see her, she seemed instantly changed by the news. She was in her late sixties and had always been an indomitable woman, as strong and sturdy as the boulders she'd brought home from her stone carving workshops, which had become a passion since retirement. In the days that followed, she seemed made of air, white-haired and fragile, her, her eyes watery bright, her voice catching on itself in croaks and quivers. A couple of months before Rosalind's diagnosis, my sister, Fauzia, had died suddenly, leaving me suspended between shock and disbelief. She'd been shuttling back and forth to acute hospital wards in North London with an illness her doctors couldn't diagnose. But we didn't believe Fazi was going to die and she couldn't have believed it either. She'd been worrying about her cats and college assignments, sending texts and paying bills from a hospital bed. She hadn't been preparing for death like Rosalind. I was left reeling, so I had to muster all my courage when Rosalind called from a hospice and said she'd like to see me. I followed my A to Z around the twisting back streets of Belsize Park to find the hospice. It was set back from the road and obscured by trees as if in hiding. I'd grown up nearby in Primrose Hill without ever realising it was there. Inside, Rosalind asked if Fauzi had been alone when she died. It was a thing she was most afraid of, she said, and it made me think about how my sister might have felt with no one she knew around her in the early hours of the June morning, when blood had started to pour into her brain and collect into a fatal hemorrhage. Rosalind must have sensed my distress because she tried to comfort me. Don't hold on too tightly, she said. She'll come back to you. I, I nodded, though it didn't seem as if Fazi had gone away exactly. My mother thought she'd heard sobs from the bedroom in her home where Fazi had lain for weeks before dying in hospital and she noticed the appearance of a squall of black scratches on the wall, which looked as if the plaster had been stabbed at with a scalpel. The patch had grown and spread across, from behind the pine board in the living room in the months after my sister had died, my mother said. I was quick to dismiss it, but I felt my own hauntings. At night she appeared in my dreams, most often in our, in our, in our mother's first floor Primrose Hill council flat in which we'd grown up. Three days after she died, a black cat with almost exactly the same white markings as Fazi's first cat, Blue, was sitting outside my home in Kentish Town. My head, my head was bowed, so I couldn't see it until I was close to it. It bounded towards me as if it had been waiting and moved to follow me inside with such certainty that it was rattled and quickly shut the door. For weeks... For weeks after her death, it seemed as if Fazia floated around in my home too, and the flowery smell of her skin in the final days at, at hospital rose off the small pieces of furniture I'd, I'd taken from her housing association flat. <coughs> I felt her swirling around me in the wispy curls of white smoke that began appearing in my peripheral vision late at night when I was at my lowest ebb. I saw her ahead of me on the streets, disappearing around a corner as I quickened my pace to catch up. And then, a few weeks after her funeral, a friend from my old secondary school in Highgate, which Fazi and I attended ran, attended, ran up behind me and said, I've just seen your sister on Kentish Town Road. She was holding two children. I hadn't seen the friend for years and had to tell her it couldn't have been Fazi, half believing that it was. Her coming back, if this is what it was, gave me some comfort, but I also felt a certain dread. What would I say to her if we collided on a street corner? What would she say to me? Perhaps we'd, we would she would remind me of all my failings as a sister or ask me to stop picking over the details of her life and death. I have come to think that the opposite of Rosin's words might be true. Don't hold on too tightly or she'll always stay. I wonder if I'll ever allow Fauzi to fly away and find her freedom from this world, or whether she'll be forced to stalk the earth a few streets ahead of me and in the creeping corners of my dreams. But it is only once 
the unfinished business of her death has been resolved, that I can st stop clutching onto her. Until then, she hovers across all my horizons. Thanks for listening.